You guys are real nice. That's real sweet. All right. Hi. Yeah, I'm Alyssa. I do a lot of things. I mean, like, a lot. Um, but all you really need to know is I really like forensics. I got the opportunity to teach it to a bunch of undergrads, a few grad students. And uh, it's been, like, a real big passion of mine. Um, so that's why I'm here. Yeah, I work at a SOC and other stuff, but that's actually kind of boring. So in this talk, just so you know, I'm going to go over some anti-forensic basics, but I really wanted to bring this to like an intermediate level, so we're going to skip a few things. Um, I'm going to introduce your adversaries to you as you, the person using anti-forensics. You can like decide for yourself if you're the good guy or the bad guy. That's not for me to decide. Um, we'll go over some brief strategies that I've learned in anti-forensics like because I've learned who you're going to be investigated by, and then we'll get into specifics. Um, I would like to point out, this is my talk. You saw that long list of things that I do. Um, anyone who works with me or has the pleasure of seeing my face every day would never claim that I represent them. <laughs> so please, if you have a problem with uh, my talk, have a problem with me. So what's digital forensics in the first place? Um, digital forensics would be investigating and finding evidence that we can attribute to something that we're curious about. So whether that's a crime, whether that's an incident at work, um, insider threat, whatever it is, digital forensics. Anti-forensics is anything to thwart that concept. Um, while digital forensics isn't necessarily used in the pursuit of eliminating privacy, anti-forensics is um, one great reason to use it. So, in anti-forensics, you might have some privacy concerns for yourself, some security hygiene. You probably practice security uh, anti-forensics and you don't know it because you're trying to be secure. So you're deleting information that's maybe not necessarily important, not putting your real birthday on the internet. These are really basic concepts that you guys probably haven't thought about, but it's anti-forensics. We can use it for anti-reversing, um, secure coding. I call it NDA Compliance Plus because if you have equipment that you ever done your work on and you haven't like properly eliminated all of your data, I promise you I'll recover it eventually. Uh, just give me enough time and maybe some money. Um, but if you want to be compliant, get rid of your stuff. And like I said, I really love digital forensics. So anti-forensics makes my job real fun. But these are the things that you're going to find on Google about anti-forensics if you look for it. And this list, to me, really isn't that great. Um, some of these are really awesome. Some of them are not. We'll touch on a few of them today. And there's a lot of reasons that anti-forensics might be able to help you. We only have time to talk about the ones in red. This uh, eight list, this eight point list is not made by me. But um, we only have time to talk about the top four. Maybe if Shmukon takes me back, we can do the other four some other time. So. Here's the thing, you want to use anti-forensics. You think you have something to hide, or maybe you just care about your own footprint. If you're not asking who is looking for your data, you're missing a lot of techniques and something that's really, really important. Who is looking at your stuff? So, we got your mom. <laughs> I, I knew this, like, your mom slide would give me the opportunity for a lot of your mom jokes, but now that I'm here, I'm like on a complete dad joke level right now, so ugh. local law enforcement, an agent, CIA, FBI, whatever, NSA, ABC. Um, we got expensive contractors and nation state ops. If you're like, Alyssa, I don't know who's looking through my stuff. Well, what stuff are you trying to hide? Private content, you know, those photos of you at ShmooCon getting real wasted that you don't want your mom to see private content, small incidents, you get those list. I'll be honest with you. Um, I work at a university. I love it to death. Purdue, boiler up. And um, here's the thing. I have seen incoming freshmen who are like really trying to impress me and like say that they love security and they're like, Alyssa, I'm the most secure. I already have my security plus and all that. I'm like, that's great, man. He's like, I run my stuff through seven proxies. And I'm like, where do you get your proxies from? Oh, I find them online, they're free. <laughs> Dude. Um, and he's, he goes through these really extreme lengths to try not to get caught first off. Once he takes forensics, he'll figure out he's doing it wrong. But um, not everyone needs nation state op protection. Um, I'm not here to dictate what your privacy needs are, 
but I cannot help you if you are legitimately the target of a nation state operation. This is, I can't, okay? I can get you up to like the expensive contractor here, but I'm not here to help you hide from North Korea, okay? So, your mom, I'm sure she's really nice. I'm sure she's great. But the level of anti-forensic use you'll need to use against her is pretty minimal, and it's not going to invade your life much. You guys probably use lock screens, vault apps, um, the taxes folder. That's, used, that's where I used to put all the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm an adult now because my taxes folder has like W-2s and shit in it. So, <laughs> fuck. Um, so yeah. It, the solutions are easy, they're practical to find online, and since they're so easy to find online, I'm not gonna have much things to tell you about your mom. But these are some of the tools that you're gonna use. It'll be fine. Okay, now, law enforcement. Um, first off, I have a deep respect for all digital forensic investigators, especially law enforcement. So this in no way is the meaning. I have the honor of having the high-tech crime unit on my college's campus. Um, they are amazing. Technically, they're my local law enforcement, but they're extremely talented digital investigators. That's not who I'm talking about here. I'm talking about like state police, Joe Schmo, who's only received lights amounts of digital forensics training, and they do something that we call push button forensics. So you extract a device, you find all its data, you run it through a couple programs. There's a whole list of forensic software packages you can use, and they find the easy low-hanging fruit data and they pass it on. That's it. So that's what I'm talking about for local law enforcement here. Um, I suggest you get a forensic software package of some sort to see what they're seeing. Uh, making decoy or false low hanging fruit is pretty good. Storage media, storage media that's swappable, or like, you know, like re normal removable media, um, would be a really good idea here. And then um, any sort of like covert data storage that can pass if it gets subpoenaed. So next we got our agent, or equivalent. Um, if you guys are wondering like, wow, what are these guys like? I found out they make a lot of money over here. So I might just quit my job. Anyway, they can do data carving. Um, so they're gonna be able to recreate your data a lot easier and find things that you've deleted. Don't tell me, oh, I permanently deleted it. It's gone, nope. Um, so they have auxiliary resources as well. They'll have some equipment that local law enforcement doesn't have and they'll have access to other stuff. So they have a bit more. Remember though, you're a case in a caseload. So depending on the agency that's looking for you, you're either gonna be like a dedicated individual to someone, like one agent's on you, you're kind of screwed, um, or you're gonna be one of many. So you can use that to your advantage and all the anti-forensic techniques you're gonna need for them are going to require a moderate amount of effort and possibly take your time. Some tools to use, I actually, I told you in the last slide, just a forensic software package. I'm telling you autopsy here, why autopsy has imported modules that get shared publicly across these open agencies, so you can know exactly what they're searching for, um, because these modules get shared. Spider Oak is a type of data storage that is real encryption in my opinion. I have a lot of opinions about encryption, just not for today. Um, Spider Oak can actually help protect you. This is like, you know what everyone brings, like decoy and burner devices to DEF CON, you know, like excessively. That's, that's this level, okay? So like Fed level, burner stuff. And then uh, you want soldered on storage media, flash, right? And I'll get to why. Um, I have a guy at my university who runs this. He's a private digital forensics contractor. He's extremely skilled and he charges about 200 to a K an hour. Um, and that's in Indiana. We're kind of cheap out in Indiana, if you don't know. So I don't know how high that's gonna get in other places. But dating, data carving is done manually. They have time to do it. They have access to like clean rooms, like airtight rooms where dust can't get in so they can do hard drive reconstruction. Um, so they have a lot. You're gonna have to put in extreme amounts of effort for these guys. And then yeah, um, you either don't need this level of protection or I can't help you. I can't dictate what you're doing, so I don't know any better. I can tell you how much you will need to get to get to that level. It is possible to evade a nation state operation. And uh, I just hope none of you in this room need that from me right now. So, <laughs> since we don't have time to like share every secret I have, I'm going to share basic strategies for all these five different types of people. Your mom, just security controls, man. Like, Password protect your phone, 
I don't know. Do, I found out a lot of my friends share out, like their fingerprints and their PIN codes with their like parents on their phone still, and they're like 28, 29. What's wrong with you? Um, in local law enforcement's case, we want to obfuscate everything they find so they basically don't understand at all what they're looking at. And since they're looking for low-hanging fruit, they're going to go, I don't know what that is. Toss it to the side. Right? Make them, make it just not important to them. Um, for the agent, unusable evidence is things that they either can't attribute to you, they don't know it's yours, or it's so messed up and unusable for them to run or analyze that they can't see it. So we're just going to, they can find the evidence all they want, it's just shit. Um, for an expensive contractor, they probably aren't targeting you out of like their own personal like feelings or what they're doing. Um, they're probably getting paid. And when someone's being paid, someone else has to foot the bill. So the best thing to do for them is waste their time. Typically, they will put up an upfront cost, like a retainer, and say, hey, I'll do 20 hours of work um, for you. And that's like $20,000. And uh, you want to waste their time. Uh, for nation state, just burn your stuff. Shred it. Kill it. With fire. So um, <laughs> we got some strategies for the two easiest ones we got, you want to make them doubt the evidence even exists, right? You're a perfect little saint to your mom and local law enforcement. If you know me, my mom thinks I'm super great. Hi, mom. Hi. Anyway, my mom thinks I'm super great, and so does local law enforcement. <clears throat> they think I'm really, really awesome. So, yeah, that's what you're going to do. Since you can't get the other two groups to not find the evidence, we want them not to be able to say it's yours, or at least that it's useful, or useful for the case, right? If the evidence that they find isn't related to their case, it's not called evidence, right? Now, we can interrupt collection to make it more difficult for them to use, um, whether they're going to be doing that manually or putting it through some software forensic tool. We can interrupt that. You'll notice that I say forensic tool tampering, and I didn't include the ABC agent on that same one. That's because I found that a lot of federal agencies are pretty good at documenting forensic tool tampering procedures and know what to look for. Um, so we're going to try to avoid that. This is going to make you immediately suspicious if you start like trying to get NCASE to not work or you're using an autopsy exploit. It gets kind of obvious. We're not going to do that. So. I have like 35 minutes to go through 10 specifics. I'm sorry, I only have 10, but we'll try. So let's start with your mom, your easiest person, right? We're going to have top secret PDF. I don't know what that PDF is, but we're going to make it look like a cute video of a dog, right? Dog playtime, whatever, fine. Why are you going to rename the file extension? Because um, it's not going to work properly. Your mom's going to be like, oh, it's just some darn computer nonsense. She's going to forget about it. Or maybe not, maybe your mom's really smart. So let's, let's take that a step further and uh, let's, let's talk for a second about forensic software tools. My favorite's Autopsy for like actual devices and Celebrite for mobile. Um, if you are a digital forensic practitioner and you're like, ew, Celebrite, sorry. Okay, look, I have my opinions. So there's a lot out there. They're gonna be able to find the mismatch of that extension we just mentioned and the file's header, which is located at the very front of the file. You can open it up in a hex editor, see what it says. All of these software packages know that. We'll scan it and say, hey, these two things, they don't match. And it actually draws attention to your evidence that you're trying to hide, right? So um, you can manually edit the file header each and every time you open and close that file, which is really, really, really obnoxious. Or you can get Microsoft Office past like 2007, which is what, like Microsoft 2010 or something. OK, look, it's really simple. It's really easy. Get a PPTX, docx, I don't care, something, .x, okay? And you're going to rename it to a zip file. If you didn't know, Microsoft Office, since 2010, actually puts all its embedded content and everything it does, it's actually a zip folder the whole time. So you change it to a zip folder, you put your shit in a zip folder, like as you do, and then you rename it back to whatever it was. Um, I can't tell if you can see the pictures here or not, but we got lintileismylifecoach.docx, because he is. He's the greatest person. And in here, we got some files, and I snuck in a silly little text document, right? Um, when I run it through autopsy, the metadata about the file, that's the third picture that you see, is reporting that it is indeed a Microsoft Office document. The um, 
the file header is there in the fourth picture with the hex next to it. Um, the bracketed content types.xml is open office document file extension, so it's what it should be. And um, yeah, I just put the docx back or pptx back, and uh, it works fine. You'll get this really annoying little word thing that's like, there's unreadable content. Do you want to proceed? Yep, everything loads exactly normally, and it's just another file. It's really boring. Um, to bump that up a little bit, to make it a little bit better, like, I think Crassy mentioned strings, right? You guys run strings against all your shit? Okay, strings will show everything in this content, so you might want to encrypt it somehow. Just put a password-protected zip folder in your zip folder. I don't care. Like I said, we don't have time to talk encryption. Just do something so it doesn't show up in plain text, okay? Put your content there. It'll look like it's some image junk that's in your document folder. Doesn't matter. Law enforcement's just going to ignore it outright. So um, that thing I told you about, remember where I said, hey, it matches the file extension to the file header? It's something that we call heuristics in forensic tools. And they are sometimes really unreliable. They sometimes suck. Encase is a big, big software package um, that has a exploit against it where if it's .exe and the first file letters are mz, uh, it'll think that it's actually what it's supposed to be. This has been known for a long time, and that's why Metasploit man treats Mogify. I didn't make this up, they made it up. Um, so Encase won't scan it, because it'll think it's a binary. And Encase will be like, holy crap, this might be malware. We don't want to look at it, right? So they won't find your evidence there. Just another way to step it up. Now, this next thing, you have to have a lot, a lot of time and a lot of money for it. So I'm not counting it, okay? But when we make forensic tools doubt their ability to be forensically sound, we can throw them out, right? It's, uh, it's pretty difficult to deal with as maybe either an investigator or a prosecutor or a defense. But um, there have been a lot of court cases won and lost based on the forensic admissibility of digital evidence. So you could try that, I guess, but please have a lot of time and a lot, a lot of money. I can't. Now, in that list of basic anti-forensics things, you saw steganography. I don't really like mentioning it. One, we don't know how prolific stego is, which means stego is really bad or really good and we don't know. But let me give you some advice about what investigators are going to do if they suspect that there's steganography in case you do want to use it. Um, don't be that idiot that leaves like steg hide and quick stego on your machine. Because great, I know you use stego now and I know exactly what tool you used it with. So keep it somewhere else. Also keep your keys for your stego somewhere else. Like your data, your application, and your keys need to all be in different places. Preferably on a place where someone's not going to recover one of those three. Um, quick biohacking time. You know, you could, you could get a chip in your skin that does that, that has the keys for you. Okay, anyway. So, um, most investigators use a tool called Steg Detect. This is a basic way to scan for steganography, um, or they're going to do it manually. And um, if you can pass your stego through Steg Detect, you're going to be pretty sound. I can't guarantee you, but pretty good. Um, and the only stego I've actually found to be super effective is stegfs, but it looks with X, <laughs> X2 journaling file systems, which we're on like, what, four now in Linux? If I saw this as an investigator, I would get a big red flag. So while it's super effective, stop it. It's 2020. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so you remember where I was like, hey, get soldered storage, get flash media. Um, I'm gonna look to see if there's anyone here who does differ. Chip off. No? Thank God. Okay, so hey, um, chip off forensics is a really big pain in the butt. It's extremely expensive. It's hard to do. You burn one point, one contact, and it's done. You've just ruined evidence. Dead box forensics, even like RAM, like using volatility and having super volatile memory, at least you can make a copy of that thing over and over and over again. I can't just like copy a chip, like physically. So if we're going to do chip off forensics to try to acquire any information off of it, it's extremely difficult and requires a lot of time. Local law enforcement will not even bother with chip off in most cases. They'll either send it to someone else or give up. 
and a lot of times it's give up. But the agents do have the ability to do this, and they have the money. So if you want to try to defeat them, you're going to make it as difficult as possible. Um, a lot of big hardware manufacturers cooperate with Chipoff Forensics, and will give some guides on how to do them better. Dell, HP, these guys, you know them, okay? Anyone heard of, like, Zudu? Like, X-I-D-U? Okay, for the like two people that are nodding, I could see that you also shop on Amazon. Um, it's a very, very like cheap knockoff Ultrabook that you can get online, and it's almost impossible to do chip off on. I was gonna bring it, but I got really angry with it, um, and I didn't think bringing you the pieces would really help. So, <laughs> um, the thing is, with chip off, your contractor is going to be able to do it and will have the resources. That's why they get paid the big bucks. So compound the amount of flash memory you have by wasting their time. Again, remember, this is soldered on flash media. I'm not talking about like micro SD cards, USBs, all that. that. That stuff's really, really easy, okay? I mean like actual soldered on memory for like Ultrabooks and things like that. So um, this should have been its whole point. And like I could actually give you a list about 100 things you should delete. Um, I, when I taught 420, which is digital forensics for the first time, I had some students who thought they were really clever. Um, a lot of undergrads think they're real smart. And uh, they thought they could cheat on their labs. And like, of course, every instructor has had this problem where they catch someone cheating. So what I did was I put it up on my screen. I said, guys, this is digital forensics. This is the class where I teach you how to catch people doing shit, and you're doing shit in front of me. So like, let's make this an opportunity to show you exactly all the metadata you left behind and just how careless you were, and I shamed them, because like, that's how we do it. So there's a long list of things you should do, <laughs> but here's the, the, the quick things that if you're going to delete, local law enforcement doesn't see it as like the absence as weird. Um, they're not going to look for these things, like volume shadow copies, um, thumbnail caches, uh, th especially if you guys got pictures, listen, thumbs.db, the actual thumbnail itself, the copy of every application that's ever opened that image, it's everywhere. Be very careful if the evidence that you're trying to hide is an image because operating systems think, oh, if I load the image as an icon, I'm being helpful and resourceful and great, and that's putting copy of that picture everywhere in your operating system, and I'm talking about every operating system, mobile, like desktop, server, all of them. Okay, so get rid of them. Um, this is a really short list, but there's a lot more. I want you to be aware that deleting evidence like this will pass this guy. It will not pass at the agent level. They're gonna see that you deleted it, and they're gonna be extremely suspicious, detailed, and thorough. Trust me from experience, bad idea. So instead of deleting these items, you're going to make fake ones. I don't care if you have to like start bleeding your life together and become a whole different Joe Schmo and take like pictures of your food and like just have things. The absence of data and evidence is also evidence. So it's gonna pass this guy, but it's not gonna cut it past that, okay? You saw on that list that encryption was listed as a, an anti-forensic method. I don't get to stand on my soapbox that often, but encryption is not anti-forensics. It is not a weapon of people who want to do investigations. Everyone who's like, hey, let's, uh, let's just give everyone the, the keys to everything, right? Let's give the responsible parties the keys to our stuff. No. I'm not budging on that. And if you think that uh, you can use encryption as an excuse, encryption supports terrorism or something else, go home. It keeps you safe. Like, look, when they made the internet, I wasn't born yet, like what, 1969? They didn't intend for us to bank and do all this stuff. They didn't intend for what we were going to use the internet for. And the encryption's the only thing that keeps your identity and your stuff, your money, your livelihood safe. So I'm not gonna dare call it anti-forensics, okay? Cool. <laughs> But if you're using BitLocker, um, so like this is the easiest one. These, are the, these keys are really easy to find because Microsoft is like, look, we're gonna be super convenient. Don't worry about, don't worry about losing your keys. We have your keys. So um, if you're gonna use BitLocker, 
like I'm assuming you're using Windows, obviously. Um, either don't connect a OneDrive account to it or just double check and make sure that Microsoft didn't automatically do it. When you encrypt a drive with BitLocker, there's an option. Do you want to save it to a file? Do you want to print it? Or do you want to save it to your Microsoft account? If you think, oh, I just won't click save it to my Microsoft account and it won't, it will. It still can. So be very careful. Go check. Okay, cool. Um, I'll be honest, I, I asked like 20 people, how do you say this word, execv, exif, execv? Okay, it's a kernel call in Linux, so if you could tell me how it's said, cool. But I did not make this tool called userland execv, actually the grudge did. I have like the deepest respect for him, so I'm almost kind of like afraid to talk about this. It's supposed to be used for like attacks, like in a red team sense. It's a very good anti-forensics tool. One you can do remote code execution, which is enough said. But you're not attacking your own machine, right? If we can avoid um, kernel calls, especially security-based kernel, kernel controls, um, we can bypass a lot of logs and some really heavy data that only maybe the contractor can find. We don't really think about how much actually goes through memory and how much things are getting called. Like, cool, you know how your application works, but do we know it at this low of a level? If you're using Linux, I would suggest highly that you read the background on this tool. Go to his GitHub, it's like right there, um, and uh, check it out. I find it very, very useful if you want to hide your Linux executables. Now you're like, Linux executables, what? Like, I know 99.99% .99 of you who are like, I want to hack stuff. Use like Kali or something. So like, get used to this one, okay? Neat. I guess I should tell you one nation state op thing. Um, if you didn't know, the US actually does this. They shred their hard drives, put it in asphalt, and then pave tarmacs with it because tarmacs are protected space, right? You don't have to tarmac. So what you're gonna do, um, listen, I know it's a security con and we make a lot of jokes about you guys not taking showers and using deodorant, but I know that you all have a shower. So that's your home improvement project. What you're gonna do is you're gonna get a sledgehammer. All the data that you need to destroy, wrap it up in some kitchen towels because breathing that stuff is very, very bad. Please be careful. Smash it to the smallest amount of pieces, mix it into some instant concrete. How much? You shouldn't be able to like pick apart the pieces and the concrete of your data. It needs to be smooth so it actually works as concrete. Like play with the amount that you have in there and then retile your shower, okay? Totally normal. I just retile my shower like once a month. Um, okay, about shredding services, um, there have been instances documented inside and outside of the United States of these shredding services saying, hey, cool, thanks for your hard drive. And then they don't shred it. Um, so I wouldn't suggest using them unless you actually watch your data get shredded. So, I mean, a sledgehammer is cheaper anyway, and it's a really good way to let some steam out, so that's what you're going to do. Now, why do we have to mix it in the, why in the concrete? Why can't we just leave it as the little bits that we mash it up by? Um, there's a really cool website, um, File Savers Data Recovery. They're a business. I don't support them, but they have, like, cool cases of extreme stories of some of the most intense data recovery they've done. Um, there's a man at my university I deeply respect. Dr. Rogers, who has recovered um, hard drives that actually have been pierced, right? So no, they didn't get the data on the sectors of the platter that were actually pierced, but all the sectors around it, which was enough to get a, some really juicy evidence. So just like, you know, like whacking it once and making it bend, like bending your hard drive or like getting it wet is not going to be enough for some people. So you have to put it in another object, obscure it this way. There's a reason why the government does it. So now that we're done talking about like being followed by North Korea, your mom again. Hi, mom. So um, vault apps. If you don't know what these are, you probably use them. Keep safe, calculator plus, you know, like just, I'll be frank with you, just um, Google like best mobile apps to hide nudes and you're gonna find a lot. I don't care what you use the apps for, but that's actually the best list to go look at. The problem is, is that these were not built with security in mind at all. Many of them just rename your file to something else. Um, they'll change the file type. They'll move the location of like your picture from your slash folders to maybe, you know, its own private folder and you need a pin to open it. Um, 
I said I like Celebrite the best. I'm really sorry for who is anyone whose opinions that hurts. I did this investigation on an iPhone SE and Mobilize sucked. And Celebrite found every single picture that I tried to hide with the group of researchers I did that with. They picked out, we picked out like 20 some images. We put them in five different types of apps and then we analyzed it through a bunch of different um, collection tools. Celebrite found every single image you know how iPhone does this thing where like if you take an image and it creates a small video because it's trying to capture it before you're actually taking the image? Yeah, we found all of those, all the thumbnails, all the copies that the software packages made, every piece of evidence. So Celebrite did that the best. I'm not like sponsored by Celebrite or anything. It's not that. I'm just trying to tell you it found so much. It found things that I forgot existed and the pin code to one of those um, vault apps just in plain text was being stored. Um, that one is uh, PhotoVault Enchanted Cloud. I'll call them out because it's bad. So um, that, that software package did not do anything. And this is gonna be easily, easily detected by law enforcement. So if you're worried that you have images on your phone that you don't want them to see, this is not the way to protect that whatsoever. A colleague, actually a professor at Purdue, um, Dr. Karabik, did the same study with 22 applications on Android, because it's Android. And um, he found basically the same thing. These can find text messages super easy, not just pictures, but that's what people usually use for vault apps. So they are not helpful in the slightest, but I guess they'll help like protect you from your mom, which is the whole point, because you don't want your mom to see what you did at Shmoo. So um, now let's say, let's, let's switch gears. Now think about your phone for a second. Let's say that you think that your traffic is being captured on your network because someone's placed to tap, someone's monitoring your traffic. When someone monitors your traffic, they're gonna have to put their, their device, their network adapter in monitor mode. Sorry, promiscuous mode. And uh, when putting things in promiscuous mode, it's a pretty good indication that you're being watched. You should know what's on your network. I don't know if you're talking about your office. Maybe it's your you know, home network. Let's find out if they're there, if they are. Let's say you don't know every single endpoint on your network. When devices are in promiscuous mode, you can send them a ping packet to the correct IP, but the wrong MAC address, and they will still respond. If the packet drops, that is not in promiscuous mode. But hey, did you see that you have to first set your device in promiscuous mode to do it? You do. So you're looking for someone in promiscuous mode, but now you're in promiscuous mode, so what are we gonna do, okay? Um, so you're sniffing the sniffer, which is really cool. Um, but the reason why they're being, the reason why you caught them in the first place is because they sent data back to you, right? They sent the ping out in ICMP and you received the response. So if you don't wanna get caught, we need to find a way for that response not to get sent. How you do that um, is something called a receive only cable. You do need to do some light ARP spoofing, ARP spoofing on this, but like ARP spoofing is pretty easy. Just take a look at it on Google. Oh, also, while it's like not anti-forensics, or maybe it is, I don't know what you're doing, um, really good way to evade IDSs. So keep this in mind. Um, but you might still need to send and receive data. You're like, cool, I'm not on the internet basically because I can't send anything. Um, so I would do something, look up a regression tap a regeneration tap, sorry. Um, take a look at it so you have some other device to send and receive data while your very suspicious, promiscuous, but not <laughs> network adapter is in use. Um, if they're sending you TCP packets or trying to send any data to you to ascertain what you're doing, maybe it's like, I don't know, Nmap, some like scan or something, or maybe they're sending you a packet, they're sending you malware, I don't care what they're sending you, um, go ahead and uh, hit them with a reset TCP packet. Um, this will help interrupt any communication that you might feel is malicious that they're trying to observe onto you. So what about these cables? Can I buy that from Hack5? I don't think so. Um, so let's make some. They're really easy to make. It's just an ethernet cable that we're gonna splice up a little bit. Um, there are, there's a guy named Diego. He has a lot of cool models. I have a couple of favorites and some not. So this one right here, I don't know if you could see, he's taking uh, the pin, the first pin, and connecting it. Um, to six and two to three. Um, you can see the colors, what that would be for you guys there. Um, the thing about this is while it's a really effective receive only cable, it does send error messages back on the network. So if you're trying to introduce noise, maybe a honeypot, false flag somewhere, 
these error messages might be useful to you, but if you're trying to not get caught at all, this is going to draw attention to you, so maybe don't. Um, his fourth model, the D one there, um, is cool. It's just swapping the solid orange and the striped orange on your connection, right? Um, but it is detectable, so please no longer use that one. I don't know if any of you have made these cables before, but if you have, that no longer works. Um, this is my favorite. It's just a modulation of the first one, the, the one we saw on the other one, and it doesn't send any errors. So like splice up some ethernet cables and make yourself a sniffer and don't get detected. It's a fun way to do that. So yeah, um, about the contractor. Um, here, if the contractor is on your network in the first place, you're gonna have some issues. Um, but the most important thing to do is appear as normal as possible. These guys are trained to like understand behavior of crimes as well. So you're going to be really want to be cognizant and make sure you have like Netflix on in the background or YouTube or like I don't know what your recreational internet time is. I think it's Twitter. So let's like put that up and make sure that you're creating false content because again, the absence of evidence is evidence, right? Um, Timestomp, this one's pretty common. You can look up a lot of documentation about it. I brought up Timestomp specifically because this one irks me. As a digital forensics investigator, one of my talents is timeline analysis. I really like to be able to reconstruct what normal is for someone or like get inside their head. Like, cool, I know every night at like 10 p.m. you start to get really lonely or like what time you get up. I can figure out so much about your life by just putting a time to it and looking at it over time. So I fucking hate time stomp. Now, let me be specific. You can't just mess with the times to try to throw off my analysis of your regular behavior. You can't just randomly change these times around. That's not how you use this. How you use this is to make MAC times, modified access created times of files, look appropriate to the investigator. So let's say, I don't know, you might have sent your friend some, some funny malware. It's not bad malware, it's just funny malware. And uh, if you didn't know, malware actually leaves a lot of evidence behind in and of itself, a lot of files that it's modified or accessed. So we're going to hide those files that have been accessed, change the times back to files that are similar. What do I mean by that? Let's say you have a folder of books, like ebooks, right? And one of them is a big nasty book you don't want people to see. So you have it in your folder called books. Um, if one of those gets accessed way more than the other, I as a digital forensic investigator, I'm gonna find it immediately and find it my most important book of your books. Um, so you're gonna change the access and modify times of this to appear like a book that you haven't used since like 2008. Okay, um, we want to make sure that every piece of data that you're trying to change matches, like it has a friend. We know what time it wants to be accessed, right? So think like insider threat. Let's say, um, I don't know, okay, we'll just call it crime. So let's say you're an insider threat at a company and you want to be able to like exfiltrate data once everyone's gone home at night. As an incident responder, I'm immediately going to go look for the times where like behavior is abnormal. If your business is nine to five and data is moving out at 1 a.m., it's extremely suspicious. That's a network log and another talk for another time, but those files, again, are being accessed and modified, right? So you're trying to smuggle out the Krabby Patty secret formula and you're going to change the MAC times of those files appropriate to the nine to five window. Does that make sense? Okay. You can't be thoughtless with how you use time stomp because again, I love timeline analysis and I can easily tell when someone's trying to fuck with me. So let's make sure that we use it in a thoughtful way. I have uh, this fun little trick. You guys know about Unicode characters and how fun they are. And there's one called right to left overwriting. So what it does is it flips the characters before and after it. So we got here like super cute something I can't read, dot bat, a batch file, right? Um, something that we want someone to run or someone to click on and investigate it. Um, and I don't know where, oh yeah, Miss Bat is in another talk right now at this exact same time and it breaks my heart because I might have put this bat joke here for her. But um, yeah, 
supercreepback.png. It's just an image. Let's take a look at it, right? Now you're like, whoa, Alyssa, I need to put a backslash in a file name. This is for Windows. Um, how am I going to do that? Windows like screams at me and says that I'm not allowed to put this character in my file name. You write. So here, there's a script. Um, it's a Python script. I didn't make it. Meet you 93 did. Um, and go ahead and use it and let uh, Windows now let you put Unicode characters that you want in your file names. That's how it's going to work. This next one's a similar tactic. Um, Windows 10, like not too long ago, maybe, maybe not. When was 1607? Like we're on 1903 right now, right? I don't know, one of them, enabled max path or long path. Um, it's just a registry key that you need to set from zero to one. There it is. And what you're going to do is allow these files to uh, have extremely long file and folder name paths. Longer than like FAT16 used to really limit us into what we could put the length of our file names, FAT32 and pre, like on, we were able to make even longer file names. This is even longer than that. So this isn't like that old school trick that used to work. It just happened again and it's 2020 and now we can do it again. It's great. So um, all files that have the long path enabled made in Windows have in that red line there that's going to be in the beginning of the file name. Um, so just to extra super duper cover your tracks, you're going to want to set that to false and then manually change it uh, if you want to. What happens when a... Uh, a system that is older than Windows 1607 tries to access something with max path. I've seen everything from Windows Explorer crashing, which is like normal. Um, <laughs> applications crashing, which is I guess normal depending on the application, and then blue screening. It's so fun to make people's computers blue screen just for no reason. It's really great. Update your Windows, please. <laughs> so um, that kind of like ties into that too. There are a myriad of anti-forensic techniques. To pick the right technique, you need to think about what the other person is looking for, right? So like, why did you do this talk? Why did I do it? Um, look, I really love forensics. And like I said, almost all of those things I said are going to create traces of evidence behind you. That's going to get you past those people. I'm still watching. And as people who are digital forensic investigators, it's your job to find solutions to every anti-forensic method we have. I think you guys should use anti-forensics. No one's entitled to your data but yourself. If you get caught and you do something wrong, that's your problem. I don't have the money to bail you out of jail. I'm not here to support crime. What I'm here to do, I know besides my Twitter is like, come do crime with me. Um, no. <laughs> I'm actually joking. Um, there's a lot of really, really, really good reasons to try to thwart the people looking through your stuff. It's your data, your life. We live online now, right? All of us. I can't tell you how many people at every con I go to, I'm like, oh my god, I've met you on the internet. I spend a lot of time like talking to you guys on Twitter, or maybe you're my friends talking at home. All of us have mobile phones that we're basically attached to. Like half of the people walking down that hallway are oblivious because they're rolling through their phone. And you're leaving a footprint of yourself everywhere. This goes past OSINT, right? It goes way past that. You're leaving a lot of data about yourself behind constantly. You shape the image of yourself online. So anti-forensics is for everyone, not just fun. It's fun. And privacy, OK? Like, don't come at me and say, hey, you're helping criminals. I am not the judge. I don't get to decide if you're the criminal or not. So I'm not here to judge you. I'm just going to make you more secure. And like, yeah, maybe totally my evidence and like what I share with you is going to enable someone to pull off some sort of hack or something. It might help in crime. I'd rather protect one innocent person than like not. So fucking hack the planet. I think I have five minutes for questions, is that right? Oh, I timed it perfectly. All right, well, if you have a question, I think there's a microphone like right there. So, yeah. Or not, or I'll come up here. Thanks, guys. <laughs>